What's going on? My name is Manny and we're here for the St Vincent's Movember Men's Health Series for 2021. Today we're talking about men's health and also mental health for here at St Vincent's uh, for Movember. And since 2003, Movember has funded over 1,250 men's health projects all around the world, which is shaking up men's health research and transforming the way health services reach and support men. On average, um, men die five years earlier than women, and men die uh, by suicide every minute of every day, with males accounting for 75% of all suicides. In Australia, males are more likely to die from preventable causes than females. Males are 20% more likely to be overweight or obese than females and the top 10 causes of death in males are coronary heart disease, lung cancer, cerebrovascular disease, COPD, prostate cancer, bowel cancer, diabetes, lymph and blood cancer, and suicide. Today, we've got Harry Garside here, and he is a gold medalist at the Olympic Games, and more recently, a bronze medalist at the Tokyo 2020 Games. He is the first Australian to win an Olympic medal in boxing in 33 years. And he's had an incredible journey so far. And one of the things that we like about Harry is his approach to life. It's just not about being in the ring, but if you're keen to move your mindset to another level, there's something in there for you. And today on the panel, we've got David Factor, who, our, who is our Director of Comms, and of course, Harry Garside. That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Man, thanks for having me here. Terrific. Well, I think I get to ask you the first question, Harry. And look, we're, we're going to, Manny and I are going to ask you a few questions about some of the men's health issues that he's touched on. But before we get to that, I think it's really important to understand who you are, where you've come from. That's always a great indication of the man you've become. So tell us about young Harry. Yeah, so I was a young boy. I grew up in a smaller town, a place called Lilydale in Victoria. And um, it was a beautiful spot to grow up. There was a lot of space. I'm the youngest of three boys. So I was very active, always out playing sport, riding with my brothers. Um, but when I was nine, I decided to take up the sport of boxing um, to try and gain a bit of respect from my two older brothers who I felt I didn't really get much respect from um, because I was a lot more closer to what my mum was doing and my mum's energy. And my brothers were like very blokey and manly and, and I was nothing like them. So nine years old, walked into a gym in Lillardale and, and fell in love with the sport of boxing within the first week and, and haven't looked back since. Sounds like you came from relatively humble beginnings, uh, but a close-knit family. How did that set you up for what you've become now? Yeah, I think I'm very grateful for the upbringing I had. Um, I know early on, you only realise this stuff when you when you grow old. And, and my parents have built an empire now, but at the start, like they they had to work two, three jobs to to get to the position they're in, and like we never went without. But like just seeing my parents every morning I'd wake up and, and, and my dad would never be there because he would be at work, roof tiling, very physical trade and, and, and then my mum would be up trying to get us all three boys ready for school and, and we, weren't, we weren't the best kids and trying to get us, us all ready for school while she was also getting ready for work and then after, after school she'd be driving us to, to sport and, and then she would also be going to another job and, and dad would be going to do security and, and just seeing that stuff grow up, like you think that's normal but then the older you get, the more you realise, like my parents are just hard workers and, and they really grinded to get to the position, position they're at now. And like, I'm just hope I'm doing them proud, to be honest. Like, I've got you know, two older brothers and, and they're going on their own path and they're doing their own things. And, and I just really want to make my mum and dad and especially my two older brothers proud. And um, to come from those beginnings and, and to see where I'm at now, like I'm, I'm pretty proud to call them my parents, to be honest. And did you know, in terms of discipline, that boxing was your thing? Like you seem to have focused at the age of nine. Yeah. You, you've gone pretty singular, it seems. Um, that, that's quite, that's quite a, a terrific thing at such a young age. And has that been the case throughout since then? 
Yeah, it's only been something that I've really thought of recently, to be honest. Like, is it really my, my genuine passion? And I, th I think it is. It makes me really happy. And, and that's, all, that's all I really care about, things that make me happy I want to do more of. And boxing makes me really happy. It also gave me an identity that was like a bit of a tough guy that I always wanted because I never felt like I got from my two older brothers. And it gave me this identity which I loved and I embraced. And it also made me realise a lot of things about myself, self-confidence, self-love, which is probably the most important thing it's pushed me in ways that I've never been pushed before it's made me realize things about myself that I don't think any other sport or environment would have taught me and um, as I said the, the probably the biggest thing is confidence confidence in myself and confidence in my ability and and being able to look yourself in the mirror and be okay with what you see I think growing up I always felt like maybe I wasn't good enough purely because I probably got looked down upon by my two older brothers and the environment that I was in I was always a little bit different to everyone else and and I think when, box, when I walked into the boxing gym, my coach, Brian Levy, who's still my coach now, he fed me with so much positivity. Your oh, footwork's so good. Jeez, you're so good. You've got so much natural ability. You're going to be world champion. And like, I know he's probably full of it. And <laughs> he says it's all kids, to be honest. But uh, when you're young, you start believing that stuff, to be honest. And I'm grateful for that. I'm meant to be alternating questions with Manny, but I've just got to ask one more. Oh, I'm not on a roll here, but what you're saying <laughs> is so relevant to what we're about to discuss. And I don't want to miss this opportunity, but tell us about confidence and the relationship between confidence and judgment and discipline. 100% confidence is one of the biggest things. What I realized, as I mentioned just then, my coach, Brian Levere, he would feed me with so much positive affirmations. That's how I coined them. Positive affirmations are things you say to yourself to reinforce who you are. And I wake up every single morning, I've been doing this for two years, and I wake up every single morning and I say certain things in the mirror. I am enough, I am worthy of love, and whatever my goal is. And my goal at the moment is I'm gonna win my first professional fight, whenever that is. So I am enough because I felt like I wasn't enough growing up. And I felt like I had to do extra to sort of get respect or to show my worth, so I did more. I felt like I wasn't worthy of love. I don't know, I haven't coined exactly why I felt like that, but I felt like that for a long time, had some failed relationships. Um, and it's because I felt like I wasn't worthy of love and I felt like someone was gonna see the real me and not like what they saw. And then as well saying, oh, I will be whatever I'm gonna be, whatever that goal is. And before the Olympics is, oh, I'm gonna be an Olympic gold medalist. And by saying that in the mirror to myself every morning, I repeat it five, six to 10 times, however times I feel like I need it and look myself in the eyes, I think it has enhanced this confidence in myself. And I just feel more secure, secure in myself and my skin and I think that's the biggest things as humans is we only really have like one relationship and it's with ourselves. and if it's a poor one you're gonna have a miserable life and I try my hardest to change the tone that I felt growing up I had a bit more of a negative one I'm trying to change it to be confident in my skin and be secure in who I am as a person it's a long going process so it's, it's not gonna happen overnight but slowly but surely I'm a lot happier with the person that I am and just like carrying on from that is and you know the relationship with your parents so some of the values that you've um, learned from them like has mum and dad had different um, values that they've taught you and um, how does that change um, how does that influence your life so far and do you what do you apply every day to um, that you've learned from them yeah, for sure. As I mentioned, probably the biggest one was hard work. My dad's a roof tiler. It's a pretty yeah. physical trade. And I, I was so blessed in the sense, so my dad's a really like a knock around Aussie bloke, like just drinks beers all the time and just like a genuine black like, bloke, like stereotypical male. And, and, and my mum is a medium. So mum talks right. to dead people and, and she's yeah, very yeah. spiritual. And so growing up, seeing my mum always had tarot cards and, and crystals and doing all the hooly dooly sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but seeing that, as long as I have my dad, like it, they really complement each other and it's really made me like see things differently, be a bit more expressive on my mum's yep. side, but then also still have these really strong core values that my dad's instilled in me, hard work, respect, self-respect, and, and you mean always providing for myself, but also the people yep. around me, and, and, and that's what dad's instilled in me, but also my mum is very flowy and expressive mm -hmm. and um, talks about her emotions, just like I like to talk about my emotions, and um, I think I've definitely inherited those from my mum, and yeah. They just, as I said, they really complement each other really well, and I'm so yeah. grateful to have such a good mix. Like, mm. in, in, in the, as I said, they complement each other. Definitely, like mum and dad have been such a you know great influence in you, and it certainly shows with 
all the hard work mm. that you've put in and the dedication to be able to, you know, prepare for each Olympics, um, you know, trying to get in and finally getting into Tokyo. Yeah, um, the reality is though, mate, my job's easy, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I, I love what I do and I wake up every morning and I'm happy doing what I do. And the team around me, whether it be my family, obviously they're probably the closest people who pick me up when I am struggling or mm-hmm. when things aren't going well. Even when things are going well, they're still there no matter what. Yep. And and there's a team around me, coaches, physios, there's always people around you who are, who are doing things for you in a sense. And like my job's easy. Like it's these people who, yep. who pick you up when, when you, and, and I'm very aware of that and always try my hardest to appreciate them as much mm-hmm. as possible. And um, they probably deserve the medal or the accolades yep. probably more than I do, to be honest, mate. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's funny that you say that because with, um, you know, when you're preparing and it just in general in life, um, men, you know, tend to not really speak up and, you know, how important it is having an inner circle around you. You mentioned that you've had your coaches, your parents, your family, um, you know, being able to have different outlets just to be able to be a bit vulnerable sometimes. And, and, you know, um, how has that been able to, um, for your, how is that for your mental health and being able to um, speak up? Yeah, it's so important. I think I grew up, as I mentioned at the start, like in a sort of semi-country mm-hmm. town and my dad's very old-fashioned doesn't doesn't yeah. talk about his emotions and and it's my brother of course and, and and i respect some elements of that don't get me wrong but there is some elements where it's like man you're really struggling you know i'm here and and slowly but surely i'm trying to win, like i'm very expressive and i and i talk about my emotions i did this challenge right sorry yeah. to go a bit off topic but i did this challenge and i couldn't talk for 50 hours and what i realized in that 50 hours is how much I use talking and expressing as my energy output. Mm. I always thought training was my energy output, always thought that. And when I did that challenge where I couldn't talk for 50 hours, I realized, I honestly felt like I was going to implode. The 30 hours in, I was like, I was like going insane. I was feeling very, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I was feeling very frustrated. And it made me realize in that point that I use talking as my energy output Mm. and, and whether it be just talking the thoughts in my brain or talking negative things out talking positive things out as well and what it made me realize is i could man i could really empathize with people who feel like they can't talk up they feel like it's trapped in here and and it honestly made me feel like like very empathetic for them in the sense of like how hard it would be to actually talk about their problems and i yeah. see that in my dad mm. he doesn't like talking about his problems and yeah. and slowly but surely like i think for me the older i've got the more i've realized like like giving my dad an environment where he feels more comfortable he loves being in his shed he loves watching the footy he loves having yeah. a beer and then in that space like maybe not making eye contact these are things that i've picked up on these are the spaces where he feels more confident and, and I'm able to have a bit more of a genuine conversation with him. And it's an ongoing process. It's not, it's not all you know, smooth sailing. Sometimes he's like, like you're overstepping and, and that's fine, but slowly but surely, I'm trying to just have a genuine conversation with him and talk about what's actually going on in his life. Because more often than not, like we just always say, you know, we always say, you know, just toughen up and mm. um, just get on with it. You know, it's, and it's this stereotype that we kind of have to break um, that's common in a lot of environments where you know it's just not safe. It just, people just don't feel safe to be mm. able to speak up. Yeah, um, and, I, and I can understand that in the sense of like, I'm not going to sit here and post on Instagram or social yeah. media my problems. I'm not going to do that. There's yeah. there's certain people that I know that I have identified in my life that I trust, mm. that I'm able to yeah. disclose serious information mm. with, and I know that they would back me in yeah. that. But it's just like I think for people, just finding those people, it could just be one person, or finding those people in your life who you know you can trust, and when things are actually going on, yeah. like they're the people that you go to, and hey, what's yeah. going on? And I've got a good friend that I always bounce ideas off and he's the same he always bounces mm. ideas off me and mm. and i'm grateful for that i'm grateful we build that relationship with each other where we can have like hey man i'm having a shit week mm. i'm having a like and that's okay yeah. like mm. it's not you know, I mean whether it be a shit day shit week shit yeah. months like it's going to become better but just talking about it mm. in that moment i think has really helped me and how did you find that in a high pressure environment like um especially with the olympics and in the in the olympic village like for us as healthcare workers we've had such a yeah. tough um, you know, two years so far, and it's really high pressure for us. And 
and then were, there, how, were there certain supports there for you guys? Yeah, for sure. There was absolutely like our team environment is probably our biggest one because <clears throat> our team understand what we're going through, whether it be our teammates, our coach, whoever it may be, they understand exactly what we're going through. They've been in that journey. So they're obviously the people I probably lean on the most. I try my hardest not to lean on in that moment my family as much because they don't fully understand what's going on and, and because they're really close to you, sometimes yeah, they can yeah. say something that's a little bit, and that, that's okay, I know that mm -hmm. through experience and stuff like that. And I always try my best if something was going on to talk to my teammates or something like that. But in that moment, mate, it's probably preparation is the biggest thing for me. And if I'm well prepared, the nerves, the angst, everything that's going on, the high pressure <clears throat> is a lot more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm prepared and I prepare months in advance. I prepare for all feelings. So in the sense I visualize a lot and, and I visualize if things are gonna go bad. I visualize if an ex-partner was gonna message me. Didn't happen, but I visualize these things just in case they're gonna throw me off. Yeah. And I think it's so valuable to visualize every single circumstance, every single situation that can occur. Mm. Because if it does occur, at least you've thought about it and you have a way to pivot or react in that situation. Yeah. Harry, you, you've spoken quite a lot about expressing yourself and, and your comfort to do so, but tell us about the relationship between expressing yourself and the um, kind of the trend in, Austra in Australia, with particularly with Australian men, um, of stigmatisation. We, 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 us blokes tend to be fairly conformist, Aussie blokes, um, in many respects, and do you think there's a relationship between that and a lack of e expressiveness and us not talking about the issues that, that are at the fore and, and perhaps kind of stifling that. Yeah, I, there's an element of, like, I, I mix myself. I have a lot of feminine energy in me and I love that about me. And, and I think that's why I feel it a little bit easy to express. But there's elements where it's like, in the male culture that I have been in, I've noticed like a lot of the time it's taken the piss and sometimes it's very surface level. And there is element that I'm like, I actually enjoy this. You know, we're never actually taking things that seriously and, and we're joking around with our mates. But I think because of that as well, it's a double-edged sword. Because of that, we don't actually ever really talk about or get to the nitty gritty about what's actually going on. And, and I think for me, as I said, I found it a little bit easy growing up, obviously having a mum who encouraged me to, to do weird things. And, and of course, my personality, I'm like, I would literally try or do anything and, and be okay with that. But I think for sure, I've felt some criticism. I felt some judgment. I felt some backlash when I've expressed myself. Um, and I think for me, I'm just trying my hardest to role model to other, especially young people, mm. that it's okay to do some things that aren't stereotypical male things to do. Like to do some things, that's the best thing about being human is how different, versatile, unique, beautiful we are. And that's what makes us human, I think. And, and, and it's okay if you don't want to do the things your mates are doing and stuff like that. And I'm just trying my best to role model that. But it is an ongoing process. And it is hard because, as you said, there is this bit of a stigma around males and they're not supposed to do these things or you, mean, you don't talk about this. And, and slowly but surely, I do think our generation is trying to change that tone. And, and, and I'm grateful with the progress we're making, but it's still such a long way to go. So before we commence this interview, and, and uh, we only go back with you uh, half an hour now, I've only had the fortune to know you, but we, we got straight into a discussion about erectile dysfunction, <laughs> as you do. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and that is not your, your average kind of um, discussion, bloke conversation and whatnot. And yet, um, in relation to some of the, the byproducts of men's health issues, uh, that is quite a prominent uh, kind of byproduct of, of various conditions. So it's obviously quite a major mm. issue. Um, do you think we've got a long way of uh, encouraging that, that real uh, capacity, A, to be introspective, but B, to be then expressive mm. a, a, and discuss it with mates? What, what, what's what's creating unsafe places for your average bloke to not feel that they can discuss issues like that in a comfortable place because you touched on the fact that we take the piss mm. and God, I, I know I'm, I'm definitely yeah. guilty of that. I rip my mates all the time. But at the same time, I want them to always know they could discuss mm. anything with me. There would be no judgment, but we take the mickey of one yeah. another. And, and do you think we, we can reach that balance of being a, a, a culture that, that's comfortable in, in our own skins, 
but at the same time not not kind of cluster and and sweep all these really pressing important mm. health issues under the carpet which we seem to be doing at the moment yeah I think that's a great question I'm, I'm very optimistic about life and about the world mate to be honest so I think see try and see things a lot more positive and I do think we can get to a place where it's like a mix of seriousness and taking the piss because there is some good elements of taking the piss and it makes people feel more connected and you know, they're having a laugh they love their mates they love being around them because they're having a laugh and but also do think that slowly but surely we are changing the tone i do think that we're a long way off where we need to be where it's like if someone was to disclose a serious thing it's like in that moment it's like hey pull back the laughs like it's this is not the moment to laugh this is the moment to like you mean listen to what they're saying and if they need help in this moment try and act on that or just hear them out and i think sometimes because we take the piss so much it's like people are scared that they're going to get the piss taken out of them or they're going to get laughed at by their mates. And, and I've felt that fear myself, to be honest. And, and I think, but I think just like when you know something is serious, when you just listen, don't laugh, listen to your mate. And it's like sometimes they just want to be heard. You don't even have to like try and come up with a solution. I know that's a bit of a male thing to do is try and come up with a solution to a problem. It's like sometimes just listening, having empathy and listening and just understanding that you're probably going through something a little bit similar and, and you can try and connect in that way rather than just taking the piss all the time. That's what I think anyway, but I think we're getting there for sure. Mm. How do you kind of brush off, you know, those comments from people, especially with social media now, um, and also just being in the Olympics, um, is there a way that you kind of have a mindset for that? Yeah, it's really, it's really heartbreaking. Like I've been fortunate enough to travel the world and I've seen other cultures and how they live and it's very prominent in Australia, tall poppy syndrome. And it's really sad to be yeah. honest. It's really sad because I'm the type of person, if someone's doing good, like I want to, I want to boost them up. Come on. let's exactly. like your full yeah. potential. And I want to try and see them like, they're not a competitor of mine. Like, yeah. like go hard. And even if they were a competitor of mine, my philosophy yeah. is, it's like, if they increase, I have to increase more. Yeah. Like that's my philosophy on it. And it's almost just like healthy competition, but it's sad that we have that culture when we see someone doing well and we want to instantly try and trash them down. And, and I, I felt that growing up, it was almost like part of the culture. And I would say some things, or oh, you just start like being a skeptic or something yeah. like that, always never really giving someone the full credit. But the older I've got, the more I've realized it's like, by boosting someone up, it makes you feel better about yourself. Mm -hmm. And it almost, for me, it inspires me more when I see someone else doing good, because I want to be like, oh, I want to yeah. try and do good as yeah. well. And it like really boosts me up. It changes my mood rather than just always being that negative cycle and negative loop where you're trashing someone. Um, but yeah, I always just try my best, mate, to if someone is doing good, someone's inspiring me, just try and take motivation and inspiration from that and try and do good myself, to be honest. What's the challenges that you've done? You know, I've seen that you've done all these challenges. It's like, you know, painting your nails and also you mentioned earlier about the talking challenge. Um, does that go with building your resilience or what's, what's the go with that? Like? Yeah, I think resilience is an interesting thing. I think it obviously stems from, I'm not a scientist or, or doctor, um, but I, I think it comes from like your upbringing a lot of the time, resilience and stuff like that. And of course, the more adversity that you face, the more places where you feel uncomfortable, that's where you're gonna grow the most. And often as humans, don't get me wrong, I've felt this, we like to be put in a place where we're comfortable you know, we feel like we're not going to get hurt. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and like that's it's a survival. It's almost a bit yeah. of a survival mechanism. And and I, th what I've realised though, the, every time I've pushed myself out of my comfort zone, and I do these challenges once a month. I've done things like start ballet. Had some really hard conversations yeah. with my dad, which was probably one of the hardest. Um, Fifty hours no talking, as I mentioned. No technology for a month, which is really tough in this <laughs> this world we're living in so many different ones and each challenge I've learned something new from and and it's like by pushing myself out of my comfort zone it's just like I look at myself and think there's like there's nothing I couldn't do and it's like that feeling you honestly feel invincible and I think as humans the more that we can push ourselves out of our environment out of our comfort zone do things that are different the more we're just going to grow and even if we don't like it you're going to find something that you grow from in that yeah. situation on that note on the comfort stepping out of your comfort zone this is really important because we've we've got some of our uh, men's health team here with us right now and they've got some real challenges in terms of really getting blokes to step up 
and look after themselves and, and take those basic steps. Some of those basic steps that previously there's been stigma that it's not really blokey and manly mm. to kind of look into because it's a sign of weakness. So let's pretend it's Harry, not, not the world champ boxer, but, but Harry, the head of the creative director of <laughs> Mojo Advertising <laughs> or some kind of spin doctor role that you're in to design a campaign for these guys to get blokes to step out of their comfort zone. What, what would your basic messages be in terms of really getting us to, to swim against the tide as to what we've previously been mm. as a society? I think probably the biggest thing, I'd always just try my best to pull on their family heartstrings because I feel like most men that I've come in contact with, they love their community, they love their environment and they'll do anything, they're very loyal and they'll do anything. So if you start pulling on the things that, you mean, it's gonna be good for your family. It's gonna be good for your kids. It's gonna be good for your wife or your partner. And I think by pulling on those and encouraging them, like, it's not for you, it's for them. It's like, it will encourage, I would hope, more people to, to actually take those steps, to go to the doctor, to get checked out, or to talk about things. Because the reality is, it is at the end of the day for the family. And of course, it's for yourself, which is the biggest thing. But it's like, if you coin it, as it's for your family, it's for your kids, then I think more men, I feel, would, would actually reach towards that. Yeah, it's brilliant. Mm. I, think, I think that's a really good take. Mm. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> it's my role to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I want to move on to your work in, um, with younger people and um, being able to... You've worked for the... Re you've done work for the REACH Foundation mm. and also um, you've done uh, something with the AI AIS in terms of... Um, Mental health. Um, like a men mentoring um, program for young people. Mm. Um, what's... What, why, what's your passion behind advocating for our young people? I'm also being passionate about um, for our young people just because I've worked um, in that space um, previously when I was in the YMCA and I find it's important that we're empowering and also supporting mm. younger people because they are our future. Mm, I couldn't agree more and I think it's really close to my heart because purely because the REACH Foundation come to my school when I was 16. Mm. And so a little bit of backstory, I had no success in boxing early on, no success at the national level. Honestly, there was at a crossroads before REACH come to my life. And I honestly thought, you mean, I don't know if boxing's for me, I keep losing, I, I'm not good enough. Mm. Having all these negative thoughts, the REACH Foundation come to my school, ran this workshop and that day was just like the turning point in my life where I slowly but surely started to delve into myself and understand myself more and my full potential. Yeah. And it's like what they did for me in that moment after being with Reach from that day, six months later, I won my first nationals, wow. got selected for the Youth Commonwealth Games and the rest is history. You know, it's like that moment was so pivotal. I honestly was almost about to give up boxing, mm -hmm. feeling pretty flat about myself. Mm -hmm. Honestly, felt like a bit of a failure. Yeah. And, and it's like that moment I got so much out of and through the process from that day, I become a crew member um, and I run workshops and stuff like that now. Obviously, I, I'm not in Melbourne anymore, they're predominantly Melbourne based, but I still might just try my hardest to be connected in any way, shape or form because I got so much out of that day and I feel the world we live in now, it's like our young people Absolutely. don't have a voice or no. they feel misheard or no. there's so many lack of confidence there's so many things they're getting they're seeing I, I was thinking about this the other day this is a bit off topic yeah. i just go on tangents and i was thinking about this like i remember growing up i didn't see anything about mental health growing up i didn't see anything on mm. like real negative global like i didn't really see it because it wasn't i didn't have phones i was just out it's like young young people in primary school um, early high school, they have phones now and they're seeing all these things on their phone about mental health, about like just like the stuff going on overseas. It's all like negative, negative, negative. That's what our news is based on. It's like, how are they going to be able to decipher what's actually going on in this world? And I, I generally just, I feel for them because I remember how, how hard I thought life was when I was that age. Yeah. You thought like you had a problem, you felt like the world was ending. Exactly. And, and, and I just think like our young people need our help more than ever right now. Like they don't really know how to navigate what's actually going on with the phone use and, mm -hmm. and COVID as well. And there's just so much going on. That's why yeah. I'm really passionate about it because I think they need help. And there's even that uh, with Instagram, it's the perception of body image is mm, Comparison, yeah. And when I was 16, I... Um, started my first workshop for um, people two years younger than me, so I'm um, two years older than you, so um, 
uh, and we did a body image workshop and it was just so eye-opening um, to see uh, we did it for young girls because they were we were seeing a lot of pressure from younger girls to be able to look good and also you know wear makeup because they thought that it was okay that that's what they had to do and it was you know just being able to accept yourself for who you wow. are um, you know it was quite eye opening and we were able to you know there was a lot of tears that <laughs> happened from that but it was just so you know a lot of people don't a lot of young people don't know who to go to when yeah. the supports they have and. Um, it's hard as well, man. When you really think about it, the, the, like the ads on TV, they're really pulling on our insecurities. They're literally built yeah. on us feeling shit about ourselves, so we buy their products. That's what this world is like based on. We need the new iPhone. Like, no, you don't. Like, this is just me. And it's like, I feel sorry because, like, at least when we're older, we can understand a little bit more. Of course, we still probably buy those products and stuff like that, yeah. but we can understand it a bit more. When they're young, I just don't feel like they understand exactly what's going on. They're really pulling on your heartstrings and making you feel like flat about yourself when like, that's their job is to make you feel flat so you buy that product or you go in that direction. And I, I don't know, I just think the world's a really <laughs> weird place sometimes. Harry, we're going to have to wrap up in a moment, mm. but, but just in terms of uh, we're here for all things uh, men's health. And there's obviously common, common themes um, between men's health and our, our broader societal health as well. But if you had to kind of highlight, and we've discussed confidence a lot today and, and resilience, but, but really what would be your top line kind of uh, uh, points of advice, say three top points of advice mm. for um, particularly blokes uh, being honest with themselves and honest with their mates in terms of building a healthier society? Mm. I think the biggest one would be speak up. If, if, if I could w w like wave a magic wand around and, and like that was the one wish I got, it was probably men to actually speak about how they're feeling. So speak up, um, believe in yourself and believe in your worth. Yeah, probably, that's probably the second one. And then the third, I'd probably say, just like, like it's like just love yourself unconditionally because I think often as humans and I don't think males get enough credit for the black like, we're our biggest critics like we often talk about females body image and stuff like that I know many men that feel bad about their body and stuff like that and I think for any human doesn't matter what gender just like loving yourself completely you mean for the good the bad and the ugly and just understanding that like a lot of the things that you do in your life it's like it's probably built from when you were younger or generational trauma or things that your parents may not be aware of but just understanding just being patient with yourself and like it's okay you're not going to be perfect instantly and you're not probably never going to be perfect but just like love yourself for the good the bad and the ugly and this is just a test run you're just like getting through life making it up you're doing good simple as that i i had dinner last night for a mate of mine who's a pretty successful kind of guy a little bit infallible <clears throat> and he's got um high blood sugar, um, the GP's flagged that, but he needs to have a proper glucose blood sugar test. Yeah. Uh, and he's been talking about it for ages to, to see if he's got pre-diabetes. And uh, he mentioned this months ago to me, and I said, when I caught up with him, I said, how was your, your test results? And he says, I haven't had the test. Oh, yeah. And, and he, he wasn't, he's, he's yeah. keen to have the test, but it's been months. And Is he just scared or something? Like what, well, what I, I just mean? wonder yeah. if it's, if it's possibly a, a fallibility you know he's a guy who hasn't really had anything yeah. um, that, that's fallen down for him mm -hmm. and suddenly there is a big elephant in the room that he needs to tackle mm -hmm. and I, I just I, I feel like I see that picture mm -hmm. all the time where, where we just kind of and I've been guilty of it as well mm -hmm. I mean my wife keeps hassling me to go and get a, a um, skin check for melanoma mm -hmm. and I put it off for now uh, we've known each other 15 years so. yeah. I mean living in Bondi you'd love the sun right? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it's that attitude though that she'll be right attitude yeah. my dad says good as gold that's his saying it's as good as gold all the time and when he says good as gold that's when I know it's not good as gold. <laughs> you know, and it's like, it's like, Dad, do you need a hand? He's like, nah, good as gold. I'm like, I'll give you a hand. <laughs> um, but it's just like understanding that, like, it's been ingrained in the male culture and, and for so long. And it's, it, we're in a transition stage where we're trying to unlearn these things that have been there for thousands of years almost. And, um, but we're doing it. And we're, these conversations are going to help some young people, especially, and maybe some older people as well, if they can understand themselves more, I hope, then, then, and they can act on what they're actually thinking or what they're feeling.
Yeah, and hopefully this conversation's a starting point for mm. that. Um, on that note, that's it for me. Manny, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, um, I think just the last question before we wrap <coughs> up is, you know, what advice would you have for your younger self if you had any and also to young males um, at this at this point in time? Yeah, so I've actually got asked this question quite recently and for my younger self, I wouldn't say anything. I would just hug him. Mm. Um, purely because I just felt like the three things I say to myself, I mean, I am enough and I mean, I'm worthy of love. They're the two things that I felt like growing up that I lacked the most of. And um, I'll probably just hug him. And in that hug, there would be a bit of reassurance. Um, but to young people, I think, I know, just like you are worthy. You mean, you are enough and anything you put your mind to, like you are capable of achieving as long as you have enough drive, will, focus, desire, passion, curiosity, um, like anything that is humanly possible, you can do. And I think just believing in that, like, I just, that's how I feel now, to be honest. And I wish more people can feel like that. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And, and, and just to be able to be in the room with you, Harry, it's just like, I'm pinching myself. Oh, I don't get it. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and with that, like, that's all we have today, guys. Thanks so much for joining. Um, thanks to David for being on the panel. Thanks to Harry, of course. Uh, and also our team here uh, in the room with us. Thanks so much for joining. Um, we'll find this on YouTube. And thanks for joining the Movember series here at St. Vincent's for 2021. Thank you. Thank you.